Hello, my name's Peter Whitehead. I'm a member of the Bromley U3A Art Appreciation Group. And this is one of a series of presentations that I've prepared for the group um, during lockdown. Uh, we are a group of people who are interested in art, who are enthusiastic about it, but uh, we're not experts. So bear that in mind when you listen to what I've got to say. Uh, most of the images in this presentation are found on the internet, particularly from the WikiArt um, website. So this talk is about two painters who were contemporaries, uh, who flourished in the 1870s, and that's the period I'm going to concentrate on. Uh, in some ways, they were very similar. In some ways, they were complete opposites. Uh, both of them found fame in an adopted country, which is why I've called the talk Two Expatriates. Um, they're possibly not in the Premier League uh, of artists, but um, I think they're interesting and uh, worth looking at. So Whistler and Sisley. Whistler is the elder of the two by five years. An American, born in New England. His father was a railroad engineer, so travelled quite widely around the world. And in 1843, they moved to Russia, to St. Petersburg, where the elder Whistler was going to build a railway. Uh, and at the time, uh, the skill of draftsmanship, certainly, of the boy Whistler, was recognised and he was sent to the Imperial Academy of Fine Art in St. Petersburg while they were there. He also learned French at this point. French is the common language spoken in the court uh, in uh, St. Petersburg at this time. So he returns to America to join as a military cadet at West Point on the Hudson River, um, not entirely successfully. Um, he didn't manage to pass the exams that he needed, particularly in chemistry, um, which led him to say, if silicon had been a gas, I would have been a major general. But he did join the survey office in Washington, producing maps at the time, it was all drawn by hand. He goes to Paris to study art in the 18, mid 1850s, then comes to London, uh, which is his base more or less for the rest of his uh, life. We'll see more about his relations with Ruskin later on. Um, and he ends up buried in Chiswick. So this is Whistler, a wit and a dandy, which I think you can tell both from this portrait and this artfully styled photograph. Um, he spent an excessive amount of attention to his hair and dress. Um, the well known for the, um, the monocle, which you can just about see in the painting, and this white streak of hair. Um, that is all you need to depict uh, Whistler. On the other hand, we have Sizzler. Since his family were in the textile trade, in fact, they uh, the silk trade, which they had uh, started in this trade as uh, smugglers on Romney Marsh, the Sisley family, a well-known family of smugglers. But by 1839, they're legitimate, and Sisley's father was the representative of the family firm in Paris. Um, Sisley himself initially destined for a commercial career in the business, but um, art took over. The Franco-Prussian War was disastrous for the family firm, and as a result, Sisley was really impoverished uh, by it. He only came to this country uh, three times. Uh, although he held a British passport, um, he applied for French uh, citizenship towards the end of his life um, and was turned down. So he remained 
uh, a Briton uh, all his life. And this is Sisley. Um, a friend and painting companion of Renoir, Monet and the other uh, Impressionists. Um, although that painting may well be entitled Alfred Sisley and his wife, um, they were not married. He had a string of uh, mistresses, didn't marry until more or less towards the end of his life. Now where Whistler and Sisley do actually share a background is in studying with this chap, Charles Gabriel Glair, um, a Swiss painter, uh, took over the studio of Paul de la Roche in the 1840s um, and mainly known as a teacher, a popular teacher, although it was a conventional uh, academic training, drawing with, from life uh, and that kind of thing. Uh, he didn't charge for his lessons, although he did expect his uh, students to contribute to the running costs of his establishment. There were some uh, areas of Glare's teaching which obviously had an impact on both Whistler and Sisley later on in different ways. Uh, he taught that black was the basis of all tones. Uh, he wanted paints to be mixed before starting to paint so that painters could concentrate on form. He didn't really approve of clear, bright uh, colours. Whistler, while in Paris, lived a bohemian lifestyle. Um, he was part of a gang of young English artists called the Paris Gang, uh, most of whom we don't remember these days. But he did have success producing uh, etchings at this time. And Sisley attends after uh, Whistler, but the people he meets at Glare's studio are the Impressionists, Monet, Renoir and Basile, all studied with Glare, although they were probably less influenced by his views on art. There were two key painters, I think, who are influential at this time. This is the first of them, Gustave Courbet. Um, he really creates the realist school, large painting on everyday themes. Uh, this painting, Burial at Oran, is enormous. The figures are life size, really. It's on a scale that had previously been reserved for history paintings. So um, in the neoclassical era, paintings from uh, the classical world or biblical scenes, um, not used for scenes of everyday people. So these are unidealized paintings of workers and peasants around their everyday uh, life. And Corbet also had political ideas about the function of art. He, he, he had socialist uh, views, later to bring him into difficulties uh, at the time of the Paris Commune. He ended up in prison for six months and also got charged uh, with the cost of repairing the uh, building of uh, the column in the Place Vendôme that he was supposed to have uh, incited uh, the crowd to destroy. But the realist school of painting was actually a reaction against romanticism. So rather romantic paintings like Delacroix and uh, Angra uh, and Jericho had produced large scale paintings that were designed to evoke an emotional response uh, Corbet's line was to say, well, we should show everyday life and the everyday life of peasants, uh, as depicted in this painting here, is just as important as the everyday life of people from ancient Rome, ancient Greece, um, biblical stories. Uh, they should be treated with the same respect. The other key painter at the time, Corot. Uh, he mixes the kind of neoclassical and the realist school, uh, not in this painting, but in other paintings you'll see 
uh, a scene with classical nymphs, but there are also peasants uh, in it. He mixes the, the realist uh, of the peasantry with the classical illusions of nymphs and so on. A fairly restricted palette of browns and greens. He's not as experimental as the Impressionists. There are no vivid hues in this, but Monet called him the master. So uh, Monet acknowledged his um, preeminence as a landscape painter, although Corot in turn had been influenced, as we see here, by the Dutch uh, school of landscape painting. So there are figures in this landscape. They're not very significant. You sometimes have to search to find them. But what you have here, a, a road lined by trees leading you into the landscape. And about three quarters of this painting is sky. So that is the type of landscape um, that Corro later used and which later became important for the Impressionists. So let's have a look <clears throat> at some more details about Sisley. Sisley actually more or less only painted landscapes. I've struggled to find any paintings uh, to show you which aren't uh, landscapes. He, unlike Whistler, he's a very reserved and private man. You might almost say that towards the end of his life, he was a recluse. And partly that was because I think he was financially embarrassed. He was having to ask friends uh, to, to, to bail him out um, on many occasions. He was a close friend, certainly in the period we're looking at of Renoir and Monet, he painted with them. And as I mentioned before, he's really very much uh, associated with Paris and the surrounding villages, places in Paris which now might be termed the suburbs, but at this time are actually villages on the outskirts of Paris. This is the earliest painting by Sisley that I've been able to find. It dates uh, from a period when he's about 25 or 26. Uh, and I think you can see the influence of both Corro and Habema. The road leading into the distance, framed by trees, and then on the left, some figures, but not very significant. Uh, and at this time, uh, Sisley called himself Elev de Corro, um, a pupil of Corro, uh, I suppose. This is also very Corro like. Uh, it's tonally restricted. Um, it's the pre impressionist uh, phase of, of Sisley. Cité des Fleurs was a part of Paris where uh, he lived, and this is looking towards Montmartre. Obviously, the Montmartre, the hill to the north of. Paris at this time relatively undeveloped. So I think you can just about see a windmill uh, in the center of the painting there. Um, the area where the Sacre Coeur is later to be built, but at this stage very much on the outskirts uh, of Paris. Paris, however, became too expensive uh, for uh, Sisley after 1870, and he moved to various villages around um, the city. Uh, later. Um, this is one of them, Louvessienne. Um, this was where Pizarro was based and Renoir's parents also lived here, so he, he knew the area. Uh, Sisley specialises in snow. All the Impressionists like painting snow, but for Sisley it doesn't matter whether it's a light dusting of snow that you've got here, whether it's a heavy fall, whether uh, you can it's about to blizzard or whether you've got areas of thawing slush uh, he really captures it all very well this is the early days of the impressionist movement the the Société Anonyme Corporative des Artistes Peintres Sculpteur and Graveur was formed in 1873 to break away from the Salon and there are some artists who really remained Impressionist um, for the whole of their career. Um, some, like Renoir, kind of moved away to uh, other styles. But if you look in the textbooks, it will probably say, tell you that the purest Impressionist, the one who remained true 
to the Impressionist ideas throughout their careers, uh, Monet, Pizarro, uh, Bert Morisot, uh, and Sisley. We're going to see quite a few paintings of bridges in this presentation. Um, here again, we've got a very harmonious uh, palette of blues and greys uh, and greens, uh, the river flowing under the bridge. But Sisley was to develop a much more adventurous technique when it came to, pub, uh, to painting subjects like this. So in the same year, he paints uh, this particular bridge. And it's starting to develop the Impressionist um, techniques and themes. So right in the center of the painting, you've got a green shutter there, which draws, draws the eye in. Next to it, you've got a pink awning. Uh, <clears throat> the treatment of the water is particularly effective. And you have figures in the painting. There's a couple sitting under the bridge. There's some uh, ladies, I think, going for an outing on a boat, um, but they are very much peripheral to the subject matter of the painting. A couple of Habema-like landscapes uh, to look at next. The house on the right in this painting was the house of Madame du Barry, the mistress of Louis the Fifteenth, uh, but Sisley is not. Uh, averse to changing the composition of a scene if it helps uh, uh, with the design of his painting. So we've, next we'll see a painting of exactly the same road in different conditions, but you'll see that Sisley has removed the, the houses on the left and you have no sense of the, uh, the landscape in the far distance. That's because he's concentrated on the snow uh, in this particular scene. The winters of 1873-74 and 1874-75 were particularly uh, severe, so that gave Sisley and the other Impressionists plenty to work with. So Sisley comes to Britain in the summer of 1874, he stays here for about three months and produces a series of paintings of Hampton Court and the area. Well, when I say paintings of Hampton Court, the one thing he doesn't paint is Hampton Court itself. Um, so he's surrounded by this Tudor and Wren architecture. It's not what he's interested in. He likes rivers, he likes bridges. So this is a, a bridge at Hampton Court with uh, some people rowing on the Thames, some people promenading uh, on the uh, sure. But Sisley likes the industrial side of this. The bridge at Hampton Court, which had only just been built, was actually derided for, for its ugliness and how out of, um, uh, it, it, it was out of sympathy uh, with the area when you've got Hampton Court, which you just see on the right in this painting, and then you've got this um, Victorian block of cast iron. And here we have a regatta going on. This so it shows more of Hampton Court. The uh, building on the right is the stables uh, of Hampton Court, but that's as much of Hampton Court as Sisley wants to show us. I think this is a very successful painting of the Thames at Moseley Weir, which is very close to Hampton Court. Um, the flow of the water over the weir very effectively represented. Um, but if you just look off to the left of the painting, oh look, there's some figures. And there's two boys who have stripped off uh, to go swimming. Uh, and there's a fellow, he's either getting dressed after he's had his swim or he's getting ready um, to swim. Uh, in the river. Uh, very effective uh, painting.
On his return to France, Sisley paints more rivers. This is the Seine, but rather than the recreational side of the river, he's now painting the working uh, activity on the river. So sand is used to control the flow uh, of the river. You can see men working uh, with the sand, loading up the boats. Um, but your eye is also drawn, I think, to that red roof in the centre right of the painting and next to it um, the chimney um, alongside the trees in, in the background. Well I think you can tell from this painting that although it has been snowing it's about to snow again. The leaden skies, grey blue colours, bits of brown, a very effective uh, way of depicting uh, a wintry scene. Um, I have no doubt whatsoever that this painting has been used many, many times for Christmas cards. Uh, like other Impressionists, um, particularly Monet, um, Sisley painted uh, a series of scenes of the same um, spot under different conditions. Uh, one of them was the Seine in flood, so you have paintings of the Seine in full flood, as it is here, um, with the flood receding uh, and uh, with the Seine back to its uh, normal uh, flow. Uh, as I said, Monet did a similar thing, painting Rouen Cathedral under different light and, and so on. It was something that the uh, Impressionists uh, concentrated on. Now all artists at this time as far as I can see in Paris were influenced by Japanese prints. They became available in the late 1870s early 1880s. The woodcut prints of the Japanese artists and um, Sisley was not alone in being influenced by them. This painting of a road going past the house uh, in the snow and you can see here a similar conception by Hiroshiga uh, the Japanese uh, woodcut uh, artist from uh, an earlier period but by the end of the 1870s the early 1880s uh, says his health was starting to suffer and he couldn't really paint outside uh, very often. Uh, he still concentrated on um, uh, rivers and industrial scenes, the boat yard here. Um, but he was financially uh, struggling uh, and this uh, drawing here, this is actually in pastels, not in oils. Pastels being a lot less expensive than oil paint, easier to sell. So um, Sisley was encouraged by Joan Ruel, the dealer to the Impressionists, to produce this type of work um, just to uh, develop uh, uh, an income. But again, we've got snow and the railway in the background. Again, another um, familiar subject for the Impressionists. So that's a review of uh, Sisley. Let's have a look now at uh, Whistler. The first thing to say about uh, Whistler is that he's not an Impressionist and in fact he had very little time um, for the uh, Impressionists. He believed in tonal harmony and the basis of tonal harmony is black and that's the lesson he'd taken from his studies with uh, Glare. He'd started as a realist painter uh, in the uh, uh, along the Corbet lines, but he moved away from that towards uh, aestheticism. And aestheticism is the second bullet here, so it's art for art's sake. So the sole function of art is to produce something which is beautiful and which can be appreciated as beautiful. And another one of his sayings there, nature is very rarely right. In other words, you can improve upon nature. 
uh, which I don't think Corbe uh, would have had much uh, truck with. So he doesn't like the Impressionists used in screaming blues, violets and greens. Um, he doesn't uh, appreciate that approach. Uh, as we've seen, he's a dandy and a wit. He called himself the butterfly and we'll see that he that was the kind of um, uh, the symbol that he used on his work. He was combative, so he had made many enemies, um, except in military matters. We saw that he trained uh, in the uh, American military. He kept himself well out of the way in the American Civil War, um, although he, uh, though he was a New Englander, he actually supported the uh, Confederacy uh, in the Civil War. And he was a cosmopolitan person. He, he traveled widely. He was based in France, he'd been in Russia as a boy in England, and we'll see he travelled to South America as well. So uh, unlike Sisley, he's a much more um, cosmopolitan figure. Some studies by a friend of his, Mortimer Montpez. Uh, let's say he's a very distinctive uh, figure uh, with his white trousers. Uh, the white streak in his hair, the monocle. Uh, I think you can see uh, what kind of uh, man Whistler was from those studies. But his earlier paintings, as I said, were very influenced by Corbet. So this is a realistic uh, painting, the head of a peasant woman done while he was studying uh, in France. While he's studying in France, he met Henri Fantin Latour, who really influenced him uh, on the subject of tonal relationships. So the harmony in a painting that all the tones should uh, should match, should um, be in sympathy with each other, which is why, you know, a Whistler will not put a big blob of, say, in this painting, red paint somewhere um, to draw the eye's attention. That's not uh, his style uh, at all. Um, this painting rejected by the uh, uh, Salon in Paris, uh, and partly because he was finding it difficult to find acceptance uh, in France, he moves to London in 1859. Now, Millet, who saw this uh, painting, uh, described it as the finest piece of colour that has been seen on the walls of the Royal Academy for years. So he was appreciated by the pre-Raphaelites and he did move in pre-Raphaelite uh, circles uh, at this stage in his career. He's based in Chelsea uh, largely, uh, which is how he gets to meet uh, a lot of the pre-Raphaelites. Um, but he does, he shares the pre-Raphaelite interest in uh, the working men and scenes of industrial uh, life and so on. Uh, we have paintings of rivers, as with Sisley. Uh, in uh, Whistler's case, it's almost inevitably the Thames. Um, this uh, is painted uh, from the angel in Rotherhithe. If you've um, ever walked along the south bank of the Thames upstream from Tower Bridge you'll pass the Angel Inn in rather high of its directly opposite uh, Wapping and Wapping was another uh, area uh, featured by Whistler's painting so here you get a very good view of the busyness of the Thames in the 1860s um, the figures in the foreground there, it's Whistler's mistress, Joanna Hiffenen, uh, the artist, Alphonse Le Gros, and a sailor all sitting uh, uh, by the river at Wapping with all the activity going on behind them. So at this stage, Whistler really shares the pre raphaelite interest in social realism and depicting the life of the working man. And I think this painting also has pre-Raphaelite uh, echoes. 
Originally, he was going to call this painting uh, The Woman in White, but there was probably you know the novel by Wilkie Collins with the same title, and he didn't want to um, risk any confusion uh, with that. So it's called Symphony in White Number One. A lot of Whistler's paintings have musical titles, uh, and that's deliberate. Uh, he felt that what he was uh, achieving with paint was exactly the same as uh, uh, composers were achieving with notes on the page. Um, now, it didn't necessarily go down very well with the critics. The critics looked at, at this paint, the painting, Symphony in White, and said, well, it's not all white, is it? Uh, which caused Whistler to respond, well, does a symphony in F only have nothing but the one note? Fools. There's your competitive, competitive Whistler not being prepared to take the view of the critics at face value, but fighting back. Well, we've got bridges and rivers again. Um, this is more in the realistic style. Um, this is the replacement of Westminster Bridge uh, in the early 1860s. So again, it's an industrial scene, the men at work rebuilding um, uh, the, the bridge. I think the old bridge was taken down as the new one was constructed. Um, your, the viewpoint here is on what would be the embankment. The embankment isn't there at the time right by um, the uh, where Scotland Yard is now, um, looking south, looking across the river, uh, where St Thomas's Hospital is now, which you can't see, but I think you can just see in the centre, in the background, the uh, dome of what is now the Imperial War Museum. But within a few years, he's changing his approach slightly. So this is another bridge, but the colours are much more muted. Um, and he's rearranged the elements uh, of the painting. So you have the vertical lines of the chimney in the background, the piers of the bridge, the vertical accents of the uh, masts of, of the boat. Uh, on the foreshore there and th the figures, but a very brown grey type of palette um, being used for this painting, brown and silver. I've talked about the influence of Japanese art on Sisley. It applies as much to uh, Whistler. Um, so a lady who is clearly not an oriental lady um, in Japanese uh, dress. Uh, and we're going to come across this portrait uh, later on. About this time, um, Whistler starts to develop a slightly more abstract style. So he's on holiday in Trouville here. And again, this painting is called a harmony because it blends very well blue and silver uh, in the tones of a solitary figure in the foreground there. Um, in fact, this reminds me a bit of, um, of those of you who've listened to a talk I did on Caspar David Friedrich, um, The Monk by the Sea, which is tonally very similar and just this one figure uh, in the foreground to give some sense of perspective. And you've got here the, the figure the and the, the two boats as you move out towards the far horizon. Again, slightly more um, colour in this particular painting, but again, a very effective depiction of uh, the sea and the shore and the sky. Um, but you also get these hybrid works, uh, and I would say this is Japan meets Battersea. So in the background, you've got the Thames and buildings uh, alongside the Thames, 
chimneys there, industrial. Uh, and then in the foreground, ladies in Japanese dress. Again, they are not Japanese ladies. They are indulging in Japanese pursuits, playing a Japanese instrument there, which I can't remember the name of uh, at the moment, um, reclining with the flowers and the fans and so on. On the bottom left of this painting, you can see the butterfly uh, emblem, which um, Whistler uses to uh, identify his paintings. It, this was exhibited at the Royal Academy in 1870. But before that, Whistler had had a spell in South America. He was recruited as a mercenary because of his West Point training um, to uh, participate in the War of Independence, um, which uh, Chile and Peru were fighting uh, against uh, Spain. Um, he didn't actually see any action, but he did take his uh, paints with him and painted some scenes uh, of uh, harbour in Valparaiso with the warships uh, in place there. Another symphony in white here. Japanese influences in the foliage on the right. There seems to be a fan or a screen which the girl is holding or reclining rather languidly. But Whistler, unlike Sisley, was in demand for portraits. He developed a style of portraiture which was quite influential. Um, the full length painting um, in this kind of narrow but tall format is something that Whistler produced a lot of. Um, the Leylands that you see in this uh, series of portraits were wealthy art collectors and connoisseurs. Um, Leyland was a ship owner from uh, Liverpool, so a self-made uh, man. We're going to hear more about them later, um, but I just want to at this point say if you're looking for artists that Whistler may have influenced, there's another American artist who I think um, obviously uh, was aware of Whistler's style and that's John Singer Sargent. So the, the shape and the pose particularly of Mr Leyland there is very reminiscent of uh, some Singer Sargent's. He remains a very kind of abstract uh, artist in some respects. I really like the way in which the colours are melded in this particular scene of the Thames. He lived by the Thames in Chelsea and would get up early in the morning, like late at night. If someone said to him, there's something you should look at, Jimmy, uh, go and paint it. Well, that is what he would do. And they are very atmospheric. Uh, his nighttime paintings originally were called Moonlight uh, until uh, Leyland, whose um, portrait we saw a couple of slides ago, said, well, actually, they're very similar to the Nocturnes of Chopin. And Whistler jumped at the opportunity um, to call them Nocturnes, night scenes by a really still River Thames with, again, industrial buildings, you think, in the background on the south bank uh, of the Thames. So we come to Whistler's most famous painting, I suppose, always known as Whistler's Mother, but it's actually called Arrangement in Grey and Black Number One. Again, the tonal harmony, the use of black is what rules Whistler out as an Impressionist. The Impressionists never used black paint. But Whistler thought it was fundamental. He'd taken his lessons from Glare that black was the basis of the harmony here. So the shades of grey um, blend and white blend in with the black dress that uh, his mother uh, is, is wearing. Uh, she was a devout Christian. Um, when someone said, well, you really need something in this painting 
to add character to the woman. Um, Whistler said, well, my mother, the only thing you really need to add to that painting is a Bible and a glass of sherry. The painting was bought by the French government and it's now in the Musée d'Orsay. He painted a similar painting of Thomas Carlyle, uh, the historian who was a neighbour uh, in Chelsea, said to be a sad and silent man. And I think that comes across uh, in this particular painting. Here's the River Thames again. Cremorn was a pleasure garden in Chelsea between uh, the King's Road and the River Thames. Uh, I think it's probably Chelsea Barracks must have been built on the site. Um, but anyway, it was a pleasure garden where you could go for entertainment, where they had fireworks. And uh, later on, as like most pleasure gardens in London, it became the haunt of prostitutes. I think this is the most oriental of all the whistlers, the use of the verticals and the horizontals, the use of light to suggest distance. So you've got the darker um, shades in the foreground, which become lighter um, the, uh, the further you get away. And then if you do have a look in the sky, you will see there's a rocket going off there and other rockets fall into the sky. So there's a firework display at uh, Cremorne going on here, which um, Whistler has captured. I said it's the most oriental. Here's our friend Hiroshige again uh, with his take on bridge across the river, the fellow in the boat on the river, the moon shining. Uh, in the background. Well, I suppose it might be the sun. I'm not quite sure. But I think if you put the two together, you can see the influence um, which the Japanese prince had on Whistler as much as any other artist of the time. Now, this is a painting which starts causing a lot of trouble. It's exhibited at the Grosvenor Gallery in 1877. It's a distant view of Cremorne Gardens with the fireworks. Uh, going off with rockets uh, and so on. So you can see the Thames in the foreground, uh, but it's a night scene, black and gold, two contrasting tones. Um, but someone didn't like it. And that someone was John Ruskin, whose photograph you see there. Um, a slightly peculiar man it has to be said um, but a very influential art critic but the problem between Whistler and Ruskin was that they had a completely different conception of art by this time Whistler is very associated with the aesthetic movement so art for art's sake art has no function apart from being beautiful and Ruskin completely disagreed uh, with that he thought that the function of art was um, to have an influence on the morals uh, of uh, uh, a country and society um, art could be used to change society which was perhaps slightly more the Corbet type view uh, Whistler no it's just a beautiful painting the problem was that uh, Ruskin wrote in an article, what do you see the top bullet point there? I have seen and heard much of Cockney impudence before now, but never expected to hear a coxcomb ask 200 guineas for flinging a pot of paint in the public's face. And what he was talking about was the, the painting that we looked at uh, just now. Um, the nocturne in black and gold, the uh, falling rocket. Whistler sued for libel. Um, 
because of the uh, damage that Ruskin could cause as a critic. Um, he was very influential. So it went to trial in the court and the Attorney General appeared for Ruskin. Um, and there was an exchange between the Attorney General and uh, Whistler on the subject of how Whistler painted and this kind of thing. I think it's quite entertaining, so I'm going to read it out. So the Attorney General says, what is the subject of Nocturne in Black and Gold, the Falling Rocket? And Whistler says, it is a night piece and represents the fireworks at Cremorne Gardens. The Attorney General, not a view of Cremorne? Whistler, if it were a view of Cremorne, it would certainly bring about nothing but disappointment on the part of the beholders. It is an artistic arrangement. That is why I call it a nocturne. Attorney General, did it take you much time to paint the nocturne in black and gold? How soon did you knock it off? Whistler, oh, I knocked one off possibly in a couple of days. One day to do the work and another to finish it. Attorney General, the labour of two days, is that for which you ask 200 guineas? To which Whistler replies, no, I ask it for the knowledge I have gained in the work of a lifetime. Now Whistler won the case, <clears throat> but the jury of uh, Englishmen probably weren't that impressed by this dandified American appearing before them and um, <laughs> <laughs> giving what they might think of as impotent replies to the German general, they gave him a farthing in damages. So it was a pyrrhic victory because the costs of the uh, trial had to be shared between uh, Whistler and Ruskin. Ruskin's costs were covered by public subscription. Whistler had to uh, cover his own costs and that was going to lead to financial problems. But at the same time, he was managing to fall out with his major uh, sponsors. So we've seen the painting of uh, Frederick Leyland, the ship owner. He lived at Prince's Gate uh, in Knightsbridge. And he was developing his dining room in something called the Peacock Room. And to be housed in the Peacock Room was that painting by Whistler which we saw earlier of the lady in Japanese dress. Um, Whistler was advised, uh, was employed to advise on the interior decor, but he kind of took over. And then he decided to put cards at Liberty's store in Regent Street, inviting everyone to come and have a look at what he'd done. Someone else's uh, dining room. And he would give people tours uh, of this room and some people said well, it's slightly vulgar, isn't it? And Whistler is supposed to have said, well, what can you expect from a parvenu, a parvenu, a, a, a newly rich man? And that was overheard by Mrs. Leyland, who didn't go down too well. Whistler submitted a bill for 200, uh, 2,000 guineas uh, despite the fact that uh, he still he owed money to the Leylands and the Leylands decided to pay him £1,000. Now that is taken as, as an insult because um, a professional man or a craftsman in this period always bills you in guineas. A tradesman bills you in pounds. So what the Leylands have done is uh, take uh, Whistler's bill as a professional man and pay him as a tradesman. So um, Whistler was incensed by this and Leyland eventually said to him, the fact is your vanity has completely blinded you to all the usages of civilized life and your swaggering self-assertion has made you an unbearable nuisance to anyone who comes into contact with you. And uh, Whistler starts losing uh, his custom at this time. <clears throat> so th this is the Peacock Room. 
very aesthetic, very um, uh, Japanese influence, but also blue and white China, something that the aesthetics were very keen on. And if you want to see the room now, you can go to an art gallery in Washington, D.C., because the whole room uh, has been is displayed as an exhibit uh, in Washington now. Uh, all this, all the design, the peacocks on the wall that you can see. Um, this is this is the aesthetic movement par excellence. But I mentioned Whistler's in financial trouble because of the case against Ruskin. It actually has to leave the country. He goes to Venice, um, makes a lot of etchings and paintings of Venice. He's there for 18 months. From the 1880s onwards, he's really concentrates on portraiture. Uh, he becomes a member in 1884 of the Society of British Artists. He's asked to become president two years later. And then typically two years after that, he's told he has to resign because he's lost the confidence of, of the members uh, of that particular organization. Um, he spent some time in Paris in the early 1890s before returning to this country and dying uh, in the early years of the 20th century. So that, that's Whistler. Well, I just want to end by saying Whistler does actually survive in the works of Gilbert and Sullivan. They wrote in 1881, uh, one of their operas was called Patience, and it was a satire on the aesthetic movement. And there were two um, poets, I think they are, of the central characters, Grosvenor, obviously named after Grosvenor Gallery, and Bunthorn. And Bunthorn to this day is always portrayed, as you see here, he's wearing velvet knee breeches uh, and court shoes. And that type of um, dress is taken from Oscar Wilde, who was an associate, but one wouldn't say a friend uh, of Whistler. Uh, but the facial characteristics, the little beard, the monocle, the white uh, streak in the hair, that is pure Whistler. Um, so uh, he's satirised along with uh, Oscar Wilde uh, as part of the aesthetic movement by Gilbert uh, in patience. Well, I hope you've enjoyed a little look through some of the works of two very different men um, who share one or two um, artistic uh, interests, but in other ways are very, very uh, different. I hope uh, you're inspired to go and have a look at a few more uh, of their works of art. Thank you for listening. <laughs>